Okay, so while the video is running, I don't want to be uh, late on time, so I will go on with the next panel. Next panel is going to be about global and regional energy security challenges and opportunities. For our moderator, I want to call Esar Özil, non-resident fellow of the Atlantic Council, to the stage, please. And for our speakers, I want to call Mr. Sheikh Ajunar, former chairman of the supervisory board of Ukraine Argo, NPC Ukraine Argo Ukraine. Dr. Zeynep Elifildizel, vice president of the Association of Geological Researchers, Turkey. Mr. Onur Ünlü, CEO of Eskon Energy and president of EODAR. Torsten Wollar, minister councillor of energy EU delegation to Ukraine. Anna Giyar Sashko, Associate in International Arbitration Group of Sherman and Sterling, LLP Paris. Hello, good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you very much for uh, being with us in this very important panel. Uh, I would like to thank to all organizers and the panelists, uh, especially this is a very timely event, uh, I believe, because the energy is in the hot topic of the global uh, agendas right now, especially uh, after the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, the energy became more and more important topic to all countries because of the prices and supply security discussions. So today we have a very high caliber panelists uh, having uh, direct uh, experiences in the ground. Uh, so I think we will have very fruitful discussions even though we are in the second day and afternoon. So I briefly would like to introduce you to our panelists and not uh, spend much time uh, to, uh, to, to go to discussions. The first of all, we have Dr. Zeynep Elifildizel. Uh, Elif uh, Yildizel is a very well-known expert in upstream industry in Turkey. We know each other for probably more than 15 years. We had uh, many common projects before. Uh, she will talk about uh, the importance of Ukraine in global energy security. Um, uh, we have uh, Shevki Ajunar. Shevki Bey is the former chairman of the supervisor board of Ukraine Energy. Uh, he has direct experiences in the ground in Ukraine, and he is one of the uh, closest observers in the energy transition in Ukraine. So I think his contributions will be very, very important for us to understand uh, the current uh, set of play in Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, Onur Ünlü. He is a CEO of Eskon Energy and he is uh, president of EODAR. He has a very extensive knowledge about renewable energy, uh, performance contracts, green transition processes. So his contribution will basically on the green energy side and energy transition. Uh, we have Torstan Wollert, he is the Minister Council of Energy at Delegation to Ukraine. Uh, like Sheviki Bey, I think he is one of the most closest observer of the energy transition in Ukraine, uh, both from policy side as well as the market side. Uh, so his contributions will be quite critical, especially I will have some questions to him about the current status in EU and what EU is thinking about the global energy security and EU energy security as well. Last but not least, we have Anna Glad Shasko from uh, International Arbitration Group, Sherman, Stein, uh, Sherman Sterling LLP Paris, and we will get a uh, uh, legal perspective uh, and uh, his uh, her uh, sorry her uh, opinions about the uh, current activities in in Ukraine. So uh, I would like to start with uh, Zeynep Hanum because uh, she is going to give us a broad introductory. A speech about the importance of Ukraine in global energy security and what's going on right now, especially uh, in Europe, in Ukraine, and in Russia. Thank you, Mr. Rosil. Uh, okay, uh, today I'm going to talk about the global impacts of uh, Ukraine crisis concerning the energy security. As we know, Ukraine is an important supply on energy minerals and foods to the global markets. This is the fact that we know today. And by this crisis, the world is facing uh, uh, an important food and energy uh, supply problem. And securing these items became more vital than ever. 
Uh, the minerals and mining is also important in the uh, global supplies of the world uh, because uh, in 21st century uh, products that we're using today are all made up from minerals and ma uh, metals. So we are facing the price increases in all goods because uh, when the crisis has set up uh, uh, by, the, uh, by Russia, when the Russia invaded Ukraine, the markets, global oil and gas markets, uh, the skyrocketed the prices. That's the fact we know. And Ukraine is one of the key economies to the global markets, as said, and Ukraine holds 5% of the minerals of the whole world, uh, mineral resources, and the mineral resources are mostly for industrialization. Ukraine holds a small amount of oil and the second, uh, uh, second uh, natural gas resources of Europe. But besides these, mineral, uh, besides these resources, U Ukraine is very important to Europe and to global markets because it's a transition country from the gas uh, coming from Russia to Europe. So she is a vital role in, in, in energy transition uh, and transportation. And uh, Ukraine has the largest pipelines. It's about 45,000 kilometers something and 72 compressor stations with 13 underground, underground gas storage, which is, which is very vital to especially Europe. But uh, having problems on these uh, uh, flows from Russia to Europe, uh, not only Europe is affected, the whole globe is affected by the prices, price increases. So, uh, this event made us to rethink or remember the energy security again as a globe because uh, we forget uh, the energy security in the climate change topic. Uh, we, have, we are in a dilemma uh, whether we uh, are whether going to, to make our net zero targets or whether we have to secure our uh, energy. Of course, climate change is very important because uh, concerning the increase in sea level due to climate changes will increase, uh, will make uh, millions of people displaced and uh, due to displa due to displaced due to rising sea level of losing land and losing losing agricultural area, and, and this will be a very drastic, very dramatic result uh, for uh, for uh, increasing of the sea level. So confusion. So. We found out that by this crisis, the uh, confusion of energy independence with energy security. Yeah, we were trying to be independent in energy by countries. Each country tries to do that. But we forget about the energy security. So uh, what can I say? I mean, uh, we found out that the energy security is a major concern and globalization is another concern on this issue. And when we come to Russia, uh, Russia inputs 4.3 million barrels of oil and uh, 210 BCM of natural gas annually into the energy system of the globe and 2.5 million of oil per day and 142 BCM of natural gas flows to Europe in the system via Belarus and Ukraine. Uh, and there are so many uh, IOCs, oil and gas companies and other companies uh, out of the oil and gas sector running in Russia. So we are facing a very important issue, not, not only Ukraine, but the globe itself is facing an important issue, concerning, especially concerning the energy. And if, if we try to put sanctions on Russia, or if we enlarge sanctions on Russia, uh, then the oil and gas, in, uh, concerning the oil and gas subject, uh, will find its way to Asia, because Asia is still in the market, and I don't believe that Asia will be in the sanctioning club. So we are really facing a challenging uh, 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 new coming months. So the problem is uh, uh, for the oil and gas, uh, if can, can EU replace its uh, demand uh, from OPEC plus or from Iran or from non-OPEC producers? Um, yeah, they can replace somehow, but uh, the problem is there is a production capacity for each country uh, uh, supplying oil. Although we can increase some, some production, that the demand will not be replaced uh, uh, by those increases. And uh, the European countries turn out to uh, LNG and the spot market in LNG rise up um, uh, very dramatically. And Ukraine... Uh, also, I mean, the total Ukraine um, exports approximately $70 billion of everything, uh, goods, and 50% of this export goes to Europe. So, 
uh, as the war is going uh, ongoing, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, and, uh, Ukraine economy will be badly affected. That's what we are talking about since two days, and this effect will uh, will be in a domino uh, uh, structure to the other countries that are working directly with Ukraine and uh, buying goods or raw materials from R Ukraine. So the supply chain chain is always in a disruption, and that's what we're talking about since two days. Uh, also, uh, also Ukraine has a workforce problem, as mentioned before. So, uh, as as everybody said, then what shall we do? We should invest in Ukraine, not only in uh, logistics or um, uh, the other consumption goods or co uh, construction, but we have to take con we have to take into consideration about oil and gas, and uh, we have uh, we have underground gas storages that are being run in uh, Ukraine, and those storages should be filled up before the winter comes. So that's a big challenge. So uh, what's, what, what we're going to do is not very clear in energy consumption, and uh, when the Europe wants to replace its uh, or replace or replace its demand, uh, then the prices are rising up. So everybody is affected uh, by inflation and by increasing uh, 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 prices in the goods. Because you know, uh, oil and gas it's not only for transportation or for energy. It's also the refined of uh, refined products from oil. Uh, we have 80,000 refined products from oil. So increase in oil prices will make increase in goods uh, in uh, in goods uh, that are being produced from those uh, refined oil products. So. Uh, the majority of the Ukraine's mining industry should be raised up, and, and the important other thing is Ukraine is an unexplored country, and uh, I think more exploration should be done uh, uh, in this basins that Ukraine has. You know, uh, you, uh, after the Crimean crime invasion, Russia, uh, ex uh, Russia wanted the, uh, to, to enlarge its ex economic exclusive zone in Black Sea, rising from the Crimea uh, water, uh, water shores. So, Majority of the production in Ukraine is in, is on the offshore of uh, Black Sea. So uh, that's another major point, a uh, political point that we are going to face in the coming uh, months. And uh, we have to invest in, in oil and gas business also more than uh, ever because uh, while we are thinking about the climate, yes, the climate change is very important, but uh, you, but we have to we have to make our energy secured because we're going to face uh, a winter in the coming months but plus our industries heavy industries cannot be run with uh, renewables because when you have a steel factory you cannot run it on uh, uh, basic renewables or when you have a glass factory and something like that so we need to secure our energy that's uh, what i'm going to mention or what i'm going to emphasize Thank you very much, Senator. It was a very um, informative opening speech to understand the Ukraine's position as well as the global energy security dynamics. Um, Torsten, we know that the Ukraine has been following very ambitious policies to market liberalization and trans uh, tra uh, transfer its, uh, transform its uh, energy industry. And EU was one of EU is one of the key counterparties, especially from regulatory framework as well as the market integration. Um, and after this, after especially annexation of the Crimea from natural guys wise, actually Ukraine stopped almost all imports from Russia and diverted to uh, Europe. So can you give us a framework how EU contributed to Ukraine's energy transition in the last 10 years, for example? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this very important event and also for inviting me. And thank you very much to all people who are still with us, uh, even though it's the second day and in the afternoon. Uh, I hope it's interesting because uh, the energy sector in Ukraine is one of these examples that we are in a time of really transformative shifts. You can even compare to an, to an earthquake. We are in the middle of an earthquake and we don't know yet where these shifts will end. I mean, what tectonic shifts we will, we will see. Ten years ago, Ukraine was essentially 100% dependent uh, on oil, on gas, uh, and uh, from Russia and, and Belarus. Uh, it was uh, fully connected, integrated in the electricity system. Now, 10 years on, uh, Ukraine is still, or before the war started now, 
uh, but uh, in the beginning of February, 80% of imports came from, of oil products uh, came from uh, Russia, Belarus, but gas was purchased on the European market. And now we also have um, the connection of the electricity grids between Ukraine, Moldova, which is also part of the same system, with the European Union's uh, NSOE uh, network. Uh, this was done uh, in a, it was a long-term process. It was prepared starting in 2016, but now because of the war it was sped up. It should have happened uh, end of next year, but now as an emergency measure and also as a sign of support and solidarity with Ukraine, uh, all the members uh, of NSOE, including Turkey, agreed to have this emergency connection, this synchronization, which means that we are in an energy field. We are now getting more and more integrated. Ukraine and uh, the European Union are getting more integrated. And we are also working on uh, market rules, which is based on uh, you know, joint rules of the European energy community uh, to make this work, to really present business opportunities for this. And I think this could be interesting also for, for businesses here, because these rules are well known. These are essentially more or less the same rules that we have in the European Union, we have it in the Western Balkans, we have it in Ukraine and Moldova. And it, it also provides stability for investors. Now, of course, it's a very difficult time with, uh, with war, but the framework has changed dramatically and we have uh, managed, because of these rules, uh, to, um, well, to de-geopolitize to a certain extent, energy supplies, even though we are in a very, very difficult moment of geopolitics and energy. When you see now about uh, just yesterday, Nord Stream 1 restarted operations, but only at 30-40% of the normal level. Nobody can explain you why. Today it may be 20% or 50%. So we are really in this kind of completely geopolitical world of energy supplies. But even there, there's, no, there's more predictability in the energy system in Ukraine now than 10 years ago uh, because we have rules for gas storage, so European traders have already used Ukrainian gas storages, which are, I think, the biggest in Europe. Uh, we have uh, now a situation that in, during the war, uh, when, we when we connected our electricity grids, the idea was that in case of need, Europe can help Ukraine to... Uh, maintain stability in the electricity system. Now we see the opposite effect because of the war. A lot of industrial capacity has been destroyed, destroyed by Russian uh, attacks. So there is much less en uh, electricity demand now. And Ukraine has started to export electricity to the European Union, which is a win-win because it helps Ukraine to generate revenues, but it also helps to bring prices down in the European market. Uh, and currently it's Romania and Slovakia who are profiting from this. And these uh, tectonic shifts we don't know yet where we will end up, but this is irreversible. And the, the, the current situation uh, of uncertainty also presents a lot of opportunities. And I'm very glad that also Turkish companies were very active already in the investments in renewables, because the, the big chance of Ukraine as a country is to turn itself from an importer of fossil energy, which it has traditionally always been, to an exporter of green energy. So, and this is for electricity, but also we are now working, for instance, on, on biomethane uh, because everybody wants to replace uh, natural gas, especially from Russia. So for Ukraine, there is a huge opportunity to do this domestically, but also to export biomethane, uh, if it's certified, etc., as a, as a value-added product to the European market. Uh, and for this, there is a lot of industrial potential in Ukraine. But also, I think there's a lot of openness for international investors to, to come to this sector and to develop it in the spirit of integrating the energy systems. I will stop here and we can continue. Then. Yeah, definitely, because at this stage I want to turn to Shevki Bey, because he was one of the practitioners in this uh, transformation, let's say, uh, process. Uh, and I know that all transformation comes with uh, tremendous challenges. Uh, I'm, I'm following the Ukrainian market probably more than 15 years actually since 2007. And uh, when Ukraine government, governments, let's say, uh, announced uh, market liberalization processes, unbundling processes, there was a big uh, debate in the society, especially on the rising prices, uh, new investment requirements, uh, new technology requirements, etc. So Shevki Bey 
probably you encountered with all of these questions and all of these problems in your career. So what were the fundamental challenges you have encountered in this transformation process in, in Ukraine and what kind of opportunities you see for the future? Thank you for the floor and thank you for the ranges. I think uh, the most fundamental transformational challenge was getting the market structure and operability right. And I have to say that uh, the original design was not necessarily working very well and, and uh, created uh, a lot of distorted uh, picture uh, and situations in the market. Um, I can name, for example, the payment mechanism where Ukrainergo, the, the transit system operator which I headed, was responsible for financial uh, shortcomings or non-payments from distribution companies and uh, we ended up having over a billion dollars of accumulated payables to green energy producers. One aspect of this, the other aspect of this was the extraordinarily generous tariffs, feed-in tariffs that are provided to green energy, all right, of course, to promote investment because this was really the uh, starship, the, the admiral, uh, you know, the most important driver of foreign direct investment in Ukraine for a while. Turkish companies have... Uh, you know, together with you know a few other Norways and uh, a few other countries, led uh, that uh, initiative of investment uh, from abroad into the sector. But that created again the uh, quasi bankruptcy of the the system. And you know these kind of distortions, of course, create uh, enormous rant for few of the very well-known oligarchs in the country that at the time had uh, their own MPs in the parliament and affected the legislation. So correcting these uh, over time and, and the new government is also making, I think, great headway, a new administration uh, in addressing these things was uh, were, were great challenges. But I also have to mention a few other challenges that I think Ukraine faces, um, and I'm sure uh, other panelists will eventually touch on that, is the energy efficiency issue. Um, Ukraine consumes at least two and a half times more energy per output of GDP compared to the European uh, countries, and that is uh, an enormous waste of resource and money. At EBRD, we, uh, as Thorsten knows well, and, and we collaborated very closely in financing investments to improve the efficiency at uh, energy users, manufacturing plants, uh, even retailers where they want to change their uh, lighting system to uh, more efficient uh, energy consumers. So this energy efficiency issue uh, still, I think, is a challenge for the existing new government to uh, to address along with these as a part of this comes the issue of affordability of energy for the ordinary uh, ukrainians uh, because your uh, when you have such a high uh, cost component of uh, production and when you look at the income disposal income levels that creates its own social problems and, and, and therefore again political interventions and then consequent distortions. So it's like a vicious circle of uh, challenges that we're talking about. Uh, one thing I want to point out, uh, particularly in reference to the comment that you made about energy security, uh, which has to be the, the most, in today's world, uh, policy option for any country, uh, should not necessarily mean energy independence. Um, if you are uh, dependent on like-minded, democratically operating 
uh, principled countries, that interdependency is quite okay. Uh, because otherwise you end up having to pay a tremendous amount of uh, money for your uh, energy security and uh, you might not even get there because uh, I think we have seen it in the case of when Texas, that was uh, the state of Texas in the United States was disconnected from the rest of the system, grid system in the United States and as we all know something happened somewhere and, and the whole state was out of power for quite some time. So uh, the, the point I want to tie all this uh, in, in the energy uh, security is the great achievement that Torsten has referred to. Uh, and Torsten, for probably you know that, but it's interesting for audience to know, the final uh, technical tests to pass the NSOE acceptance were actually completed on the 23rd, the day before the Russian attack on, on Ukraine. So by divine intervention that, that was out of the way before uh, the bully of the region, the vicious tyrant uh, attacked our beloved Ukraine. Uh, but this uh, integration into NSOE is, is very much this energy security uh, that Ukraine needs to have and it of course is, is a mutual game. It also provides, as you say, benefits for Ukraine's neighbors and members of the uh, energy community. So I, I don't want to uh, sort of take too much time, but when you look at the components of primary energy, the, the coal, the uh, uh, renewables, uh, the uh, hydro, and in the case of Ukraine, um, nuclear and oil and gas. You know, it is clear that each of these sectors, while you need to have a coherent uh, energy transformation policy and, and implementation actions, would need their own specific uh, solutions that need to be. Design. So there's a lot of uh, uh, issues to be addressed by the policymakers, by the technical people, technicians, uh, by uh, the people of uh, Ukrainergo, uh, Naftagas, and all those colleagues to, to sort out. So I'll stop here, and uh, I think we can have a discussion as opposed to just long talks. Yeah, Thank de you. Definitely. I certainly agree with you about integration of Ukraine with European energy systems, because if Ukraine hadn't taken that measures before, most probably the situation would have been very catastrophic today uh, because of energy uh, supply or energy income or energy security. I, I certainly agree with you. Um, and I don't want to steal the philosophical discussion, but Again, I cannot be more agree with you than uh, no one is no one is an independent energy island today in the world. So even though, for example, the current case in Turkey, we are can we continue directly importing gas from Russia, and we are not expecting any problem for the winter. But since the Ukraine, since the Russian invasion in Ukraine, steering the oil prices up in international markets. And actually, Turkey also needs spot LNG in the winter time. Most probably, we will have a very difficult situation to find spot LNG, and all the prices are rising. So, again, even if you don't have direct physical flow problem, at the end of the day, the prices are affecting to you, and which is also uh, equally uh, related with the energy security. Because if prices are not affordable, even we cannot talk about the, uh, supply security. So, in this time, actually, I want to turn to Onur Bay because we talk about uh, hydrocarbons, we talk about market integration, uh, we talk about transformation in Ukraine, and now I want to uh, return to the expert in the energy efficiency and the renewable side. So we know that in Ukraine has huge potential on the renewables. There are some Turkish investors already invested to solar energy. And uh, uh, as Sheviki Bey explained that Ukraine in energy, in the, uh, Ukraine in overall as a country needs huge efficiency measures. Uh, so can you please elaborate how the energy efficiency uh, can help 
country or countries to increase their supply security, decrease their energy bills, as well as how uh, com countries in the future should attract new investors to the renewable energy side. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's uh, really a pleasure to share the floor with these distinguished panelists. <clears throat> you know, the world ecosystem is changing. It's changing dramatically to tackle climate change. Um, it all started with COVID first. Uh, this what so-called earthquake in the in the in the world ecosystem. Uh, then we see supply and demand measures change. We see freight costs went higher. Energy prices go over the roof, and it all ended up with Russian invasion on uh, Ukraine. So uh, the not only the we we have three obstacles right now. One of them is the climate change. The second one is. As uh, panelists mentioned, energy security. The, the the third one is, as you mentioned, is the energy prices. So at the end of the day, we use the most out of the energy because when we when we look at the climate change issue, uh, the the emissions increase very dramatically, even though we thought after COVID, we, we went to our homes, we closed the offices and everything. We thought that the emissions will go lower, but we have the record numbers on the emissions. So it's it's not the case. Um, the world is depending very much on energy and the source for emissions is like 75% on the energy production itself. So we, may, we have to make the most out of the energy we produce or we use that's the that's the scenario as you mentioned because of the increasing energy prices if we look at turkey turkey paid like 54 billion dollars um, at most in, in, in the past but if you look at today the first six months is 48 billion dollars so it's it's going dramatically high um, when when we look at on the energy efficiency side energy efficiency is seen as the um, first fuel um, on, on tackling climate change and it's seen as the newest renewable energy source um, so that's that's quite critical energy international energy energy in international energy agency thinks that 40% uh, of emission reduction will come from uh, energy efficiency itself. Why it's that important when we look at the industries, uh, even in Ukraine, it's quite the same. Um, existing ones are um, usually old technology because when you when you invest on a new plant, in the, the previous discussion was inviting all the investors to Ukraine to have these factories. So initial goal for an investor is to produce that product in the factory. So it's not that uh, how much energy you consume. So whether it's a new factory or an old one, there is a huge potential when we make the calculations that are rising from the studies that we have done uh, in the field, we see that there is a, uh, almost 35 to 40% of energy savings in the industry. Uh, when you add it up to you know, domestic usage of energy, there is a huge, huge potential there. The, the important issue is that we have to keep in mind that, as uh, Mr. Sherky mentioned about the BRD's approach, there are energy service companies in the field, in Europe, in, in Turkey, in Ukraine, who can also um, cover the initial investment there and share the savings so investors or the factory owners or the building owners, they don't have to pay anything for that, that sort of improvement. When we look at renewable energy, uh, of course, Ukraine has a huge potential with the green fields and the industries with the roofs. Uh, and that also helps both the emission reduction and the energy security as well. Um, and when we look at the technologies that are uh, driven in the near future is mainly focusing on heat pumps, ORC systems. So those are due to the fact that like we would like to change our cars uh, from fuel to electricity. We need to try to switch the factories 
to consume more electricity than uh, fossil fuels. So uh, if we want to do that, we need to find a good source for electricity. And Ukraine has a huge potential there uh, with the renewable energy. That's what I believe. I, I, I believe. I also believe that in the near future, with the new developments on energy storage, battery systems and everything, these renewable energy systems will not only be available uh, throughout the daytime, but you can you can easily store the energy produced and use it in the nighttime as well. So we we see a great potential there. There is a uh, huge potential not only for um, Ukrainian companies, but for the companies who would like uh, for the countries who would like to support Ukraine as well. And that way, uh, we can easily reduce the uh, energy imports of Ukraine, uh, as well as Turkey. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> very crucial uh, intervention. Uh, with the current energy prices, I think almost all projects are feasible. Yeah. <laughs> well, for, when I reviewed the last five projects in my own businesses, the one is the green hydrogen. And like two years ago, I do remember very well that we were saying for the green hydrogen, to make the feasibility of the green hydrogen, we need to wait another 10 or 15 years. Now it's feasible with the current prices. Uh, I reviewed another project about uh, storage, battery storage integration to the grid. And I was saying again, like two years ago, probably we have to wait another 10 to 15 years and still they are becoming feasible. Uh, most of the projects uh, are becoming very feasible, but the question mark is still how long the gas prices will be that high. Because this is a big question mark and still um, with the recession expectations are becoming more and more grand in the global economies. So expectations to drop in energy prices also will be uh, another issue. And if you look at the historical chart between the correlation of gas prices as well as oil prices, it totally diverged because of the geopolitical risk right now. The market is basically pricing the geopolitical risk. That's why actually the prices are high. I'm also very optimistic on the renewable energy side, renewable energy technologies, but still the question mark will be how long that oil and gas prices will remain high. I don't know. So last but not least, um, I would like to turn to uh, Anna for her intervention before going to Q&A uh, session. Please, floor is yours, Anna. Thank you. I would like also to thank the audience to stay with us in the afternoon. My topic is uh, quite controversial because I know that uh, business does not like to discuss disputes or even to think about disputes, but this is a part of uh, the reality. It's no doubt that the Russian invasion of Ukraine will have a far-reaching impact on the global energy system, disrupting chain of uh, supply. And today we see already that the general picture has changed for governments, for companies, for investors, and they are trying to navigate in the new reality. Even before the war, disputes were, were quite common in the energy sector. The disputes usually high stake, political, involving different aspects, technical aspects, uh, regulatory aspects. So what are the disputes, what are the risks we are contemplating already and we will see in the near future. First, sanctions. And sanctions, very obvious uh, point for the sanctions, you need to exit Russia you, you, or how you exit Russia. But some companies decide to continue business with Russia and here we see these companies trying to navigate not to hold liable for the violation of sanction regulations. On the other side, Russia adopted measures, countermeasures against unfriendly countries in the European Union. And even more, now if you want to sue a Russian party, a Russian company, if you have a dispute, it's it become even difficult to appoint an arbitrator. For example, ICC in Paris now just uh, inventing schemes how to get to receive payment or to pay a Russian arbitrator. In Ukraine, we continue uh, not only a fight in war, but economic fight, which is very important. And I think it's uh, nearly one week ago, 
an advisor to the president, sent a letter to four international banks, JP Morgan, City Group, HBC, and the Société Générale, requesting them to stop financing Russia, to exit Russian companies, and especially not even to grant any loans. And in this letter, this person explains that you are committing war crimes. Because while financing Russian oil companies, Russian oil industry, you are financing war against Ukraine. Once the war will be over, these banks will be sued by the Ukrainian Ministry of Justice for war crimes. And currently, the Security Service of Ukraine is collecting data on these banks. Uh, we know that you cannot sue a legal person before the International Criminal Court, but still you can sue management of these banks. So I think it's a uh, it's very new, not, uh, creative approach, but we will see what will happen after the war. But as for now, the Ukrainian government already announced that companies, banks involved in business with Russia would not be able to participate in the reconstruction of Ukraine. Another potential, not only be, uh, disputes, but general projects that are taking place, that are already in, play, uh, in place, it's how to change uh, the system and how to create more possibilities to avoid using Russian uh, foil. It's, uh, we have a Rare Power EU initiative by the European Union with aim to stop using Russian energy by 2030. And as a part of this initiative, some countries like uh, Germany, Greece, have already announced uh, construction of the LNG terminals. Other countries also considering, for example, Estonia is planning to build uh, floating storage and another LNG facility. And also recently, US and the European Union revealed a deal that would allow the US to export more LNG to, to Europe. And other countries declared their intention uh, to build more facilities to build uh, to use renewable energy. In France, Emmanuel Macron, the president, announced uh, plans to build more nuclear power plants in the near future. So here we have very short time frames for for this. Uh, very important plan, so I think that we will see more disputes, but also I think it's a great opportunity for Turkish construction companies to come to France, to come to Europe, and really, inshallah, let's see. So I think that uh, as we don't have enough time, and uh, really thank you for this event, and if you would like to help uh, Ukraine spread the vote about the event, because we see on LinkedIn, on Facebook, it's very important to keep speaking not only about the war, but about the future of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for your remarks, and I would like to thank all the panelists. Before asking my questions, I would like to return to audiences because we have limited time. And if there, are, if there is a question or if, if any comment from the audiences, I would like to give the priority. Yeah, there's one gentleman over there. Yes, thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. Uh, all of you mentioned about the gas, about the hydrogen about electricity, but none of you have mentioned about the 55% of Ukraine's energy area, I mean the nuclear energy. I would be very much appreciated to look from you, your point of view, what kind of future for nuclear energy do you see in Ukraine? And uh, yeah, looking forward for it, thank you. Who wants to take this question? I can have a go and then sure. Uh, it's it's clear that uh, Ukraine is going to use, as it has been, nuclear energy as a, one of the main uh, powers. And then I think we've all read about the the ten uh, the contract uh, with Westinghouse being increased from five to ten uh, reactors uh, uh, or, or uh, turbines with uh, Energoatom. 
the issue with nuclear until now was uh, again you know that you had the dependency on on the supplier of nuclear fuel but that is obviously being gradually addressed and uh, my guess is that nuclear will continue to play this very dominant role uh, the renewable energy is uh, as the system auction system is now uh, set to work uh, to uh, bring the prices to competitive levels uh, from the exorbitant levels they were uh, there will be a good uh, mix with the storage capacity that's being added as well so in short i think uh, nuclear energy will have a continued significant role but i think Yes, I want to add something about nuclear energy. In Ukraine and we are on the same boat on nuclear energy because uh, our nuclear uh, ours is being constructed and yours are was constructed by Russian uh, Russian technology. So we are dependent on Russia on nuclear technology uh, issue. The, pro uh, the the problem if we want to cope with the climate, we need a controllable and sustainable uh, energy, which is the nuclear power plants. The problem with the nuclear power plants, as everybody knows, when you have the uh, capacity to produce the uh, uranium to be used in nuclear power plants, that, plants, then you have the capacity to produce nuclear bombs. That's what a uh, few countries have this ability on uh, in globe, uh, uh, to, starting with Russia, uh, United Kingdom, United States, and so forth. Few countries with France and uh, Japan. So we, uh, so I believe that the coming, the next coming uh, year, decades, let's say, will be uh, powered by nuclear. Uh, so we have to invest, or we have to find some way uh, to to invest in nuclear technology because. Uh, Personally, I don't believe in renewables that we can run our countries on the clim uh, on nature-driven uh, energies because we are talking about the climate is going to change and we're trying to put our grid system onto the changing climate. The climate will not only change by itself, it will change by sunny uh, times, by uh, sea level rises, by wind, uh, wind, uh, wind uh, uh, flow uh, lines, let's say. So we're trying to make us dependent on nature and we're talking about the nature change. This is a dilemma that we're facing for. And I have one more comment to you. Uh, you said uh, we don't expect to uh, have the oil and gas prices rise up. No, because uh, in, uh, since 2014, when the oil prices fell down to $30, uh, investments were halted in EMP, expression and production. And since uh, since 2014, I've been constantly telling that we need to increase investment in EMP because we're going to face the next coming decade a shortage of oil and gas production. So uh, the due to oil prices, uh, EMP uh, uh, investments, capital investments were halted. And in 2018 and 2019, the oil prices were trying to rise up, and they came approximately 60 to 80 dollar per barrel uh, at that level. And then the climate, the Paris uh, climate uh, agreement was um, uh, signed, and that agreement has halted 35 percent of the investment in the EMP again. So we are facing, or we are going to face, the shortage of oil and gas production in the coming decades. Of course, everybody knows by 2020, the COVID uh, uh, decreased the uh, demand and then the prices fall again. So another another period to halt the EMP uh, investments. So we're going to face shortage about oil and gas uh, in the in the coming decades. So I don't expect that their prices will be lowered down in the uh, next coming decades. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, before going to the nuclear question, which is really very important and very interesting, just I wanted to highlight one thing which also was addressed in the previous panel. We see really a separation of ways between Ukraine on the one side and Russia, Belarus on the other side. We see it in the energy sector, in the outlook, in the modernization tendency, also in the market integration. They're really going apart. And I think this is something which many investors have not yet really internalized also in their organizational structure. For them, this is one market. But this is no longer the reality. And I suppose 
it will become more and more clear. And I think the sooner companies adopt this approach, and I'm German, and I, I know a lot of German companies traditionally have run this Eastern European business from Moscow. This will not work, uh, just as a general remark. And in energy, we see it very, very clearly. A nuclear. Uh, un unfortunately, we have now a new, a new concern, which is the security concern because of the war. And we have all followed with horror what is happening in Zaporizhia. Uh, and this is one question which, of course, Ukraine will have to live with somehow. So nobody knows really how this will end. So it is not only the traditional concerns of where do I get the fuel, because Ukraine has made a lot of progress there. Already now half of the fuel comes from Westinghouse, half the fuel comes from 12, from Russia. So diversification. I think Ukraine is the only country who has really systematically worked on fuel diversification for Soviet-built or Russian-built nuclear reactors. And I think this is also an example for other countries to, to really seriously consider. It's possible. Of course it has a price, but it's possible. And Ukraine shows that you can do this with a technology that other, also other countries are employing. Uh, the main question, I mean, for Ukraine, the power plants, they are in the rhythm of uh, lifetime prolongation, so Energo Atom is working on this, and until, let's say, 10, 15 years, uh, probably they will run on mostly on existing capacity. The big question is how this capacity will be replaced. And this is not unique to Ukraine, that's a big question for countries like France, etc., who all build nuclear reactors more or less at the same time. And then the question is, of course, of technology cost. And this is something very difficult to predict. I mean, I have seen various of numbers. And this will also be of relevance for Ukraine, because uh, if you are in a common market, in a wider European market, more or less the same rules apply, because you will have more and more uh, harmonization of prices, of cost. Uh, hopefully, Ukraine will also have uh, no longer the, the increased country risk, because especially for new build, uh, capital cost is critical. So if you only have one, two percent more capital cost for nuclear power plant, it becomes really expensive. So that's very difficult to, to answer, but in the short run for Ukraine, the existing fleet will continue. At least this is the planning of the government. And the real short-term question is the war. And that's something, and we have seen this seems to be a war tactic of Russia, because the first thing they did, they came to Chernobyl, through the nuclear zone, through the radioactive, let's say, contaminated zone, just to reach Kiev. Because they knew nobody will fight in this zone, because you have radio, radiological risks. But they dedicated some people, or troops, to conquer Zaporizhia, and they have, were on the way to uh, conquer South Ukrainian nuclear power plants, uh, which were then defeated. So that seems to be a war tactic. To my knowledge, that's the first time in the history of war that nuclear power plants are used as a target in a war and potentially as a weapon. And this is something which I think we have not yet really internalized, unfortunately. That's critical. Also, one more remark. Uh, we see more and more, uh, especially US-based SMR companies are active in the Balkan and Southeastern European countries. So probably SMR technology will further develop uh, in the years to come. And also, in addition to your comments, uh, I think the nuclear will be with us in the future as well. I think we have uh, three minutes, or oh, one minute to go, and there's one gentleman here as well. I want to give the floor to him. Hi. I have a question. How do you think? Uh, is green hydrogen able to replace natural gas? And also, I am curious, how, what do you think about, uh, can we produce hydrogen um, using electricity from nuclear power plant, and after that, storage it in underground storages, and became, for Ukraine, can became uh, European hydrogen hub, and export hydrogen to Europe instead of natural gas? No, no, you don't. <laughs> yes, thanks a lot for the question, because uh, actually we had, we have, uh, between the European Union and Ukraine, we have uh, what we call a Green Deal dialogue. And one of these uh, main components is what will we do on developing the hydrogen market. And there the idea is that Ukraine will participate fully in the development of a new market. So it's not joining an existing market with existing rules, but really 
creating it from scratch. And one of the priorities uh, was uh, what do we do about green hydrogen because the market is not yet there. There is a political will, a political ambition to create such a market in the EU and especially in some uh, advanced countries like Germany. Uh, and uh, we were planning, actually it should have started by now, a big study, a technical study, uh, how to use Ukraine gas pipeline network for transporting hydrogen, different options, uh, mixes or pure hydrogen. Also with the gas storage operator, how to store hydrogen at a big scale. Uh, and the idea was to have, to use the existing infrastructure to uh, make Ukraine a, a green hydrogen hub for supply internally. And also we had, for instance, Mariupol was supposed to be a pilot, uh, the, exactly the Azov style plant, uh, there should have been a wind park uh, producing green hydrogen. Part of it was supposed to be used by a green steel line in Azov style. And part of it was supposed to give, go probably by river barges uh, to the Danube and then up to Germany. So that was, and there were talks with Siemens and I think even EBRD was approached. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, we were, we were seriously thinking about it, working on it. We had the political support from our side, from all sides. And in the EU hydrogen strategy, uh, Ukraine is, is mentioned as a key partner. And uh, the, in, the, in the Hydrogen Alliance of the European Union, Ukraine is a member. And the aim was that uh, 8 to, uh, to uh, 10 uh, BCM of hydrogen would be produced by Ukraine, but it was just an intention. Mm -hmm. So we see this as very promising, and as you said, there's a huge potential. But now, of course, we have to reassess also after the damages to the war, what will happen, also what will happen to the investments that, uh, for instance, Turkish companies have already done. Yeah, because this, the renewable energy or renewable electricity production is the, the basis for all this, these new business models. Thank you. Um, we used two more minutes extra, so I want to stop here uh, because there are other panels as well. Thank you very much for joining me today.